Hello, and thank you so much for watching our videos and our live streams. If this blesses you in any way, please follow us on social media and subscribe to our channels. Hit the like button so that we can reach more eyes, ears, and hearts. Amen. We've uh, been in a series uh, through the book of Romans, and we've been going verse by verse, and now we are in chapter 5. And we're going to be in verse 5 to 11 today. So let's go ahead and read it together. Uh, for all of my precious note takers, if you're looking for a title, we're going to call this sermon Agape Love, Agape Love. Uh, verse 5, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at the right time when we were still powerless, can you say powerless? Powerless. Christ died for the ungodly. Can you say ungodly? Uh, verse 7, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from the wrath of God through him? For if while we were God's enemies. Can somebody say enemies? You know, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Verse 11 says, not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Let's go ahead and start again at verse 5. It says that God's love has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. When you study what that word in the Greek is for pouring out, it speaks of to fill to the point of overflow. So God's love is to so fill our hearts and so fill our lives that his love flows into us and then it flows out of us. Note that he's not talking about human love. He's talking about God's love. And we're going to see in today's passage how different God's love is from human love. Now, if I gave everybody a, an assignment here and I gave you a piece of paper and I told you to make a line right down the middle and, and write God's love on one section and human love on the other section and, and to differentiate the two loves, I wonder what you would come up with because there's a lot that you can write down. God's love had its own Greek word that the early Christians used to describe it, and it's the word agape, agape. And, you know, I think it's very tragic that in our English Bibles, everything is translated love when there are actually many different Greek words for love. And, uh, you know, we can actually misread the New Testament by failing to distinguish God's love from human love because God's love is different in origin, in essence, and in expression. And as we keep reading through this passage, we're going to see that it's actually very insulting and degrading to put God's love in the same category as human love. Now, you're going to have to forgive me uh, for what I'm about to say. Just please bear in mind that I was a youth pastor for quite a while. So I remember uh, when I was watching that movie, Forrest Gump, uh, Throughout the movie, he would have this line, and he would say, I got to pay. I got to pay. In this thick uh, southern accent. And it sounds a lot like I got to pay. <laughs> you know, I got to pay. I got to pay. And obviously, they're not the same. And uh, someone sh shouldn't even mention it in the same sentence or in the same sermon. You shouldn't ever talk about those together. Because uh, having to use the restroom is a very natural and it's very common to the human experience. And same with human love. A uh, Human love is very common here on planet Earth. But God's love is from another realm. It's not natural, it's supernatural. It's not of earth, it's from heaven. And that heavenly love is going to fill our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And when that love is poured in, it transforms our hearts. And when that love flows out, it transforms the world around us. And that's how the early Christians turned their world upside down. When the early Christians gathered, they actually called it the Agape Feast, the agape feast, a love feast, but it's talking about the love of God. 
You know, the early church father, uh, Tertullian, he's from the second century, he wrote that the pagans would look on and see these agape feasts from a distance and they would conclude, wow, look at how much they love one another. We pagans, we hate each other. Look how they would die for each other. We're just trying to kill each other. When Christians would be martyred, uh, they would often be slain while praying for the forgiveness of their murderers and interceding for their souls. Now, how did they do that? It's not human love. It's the love of God that was poured into their hearts by the Holy Spirit. And as we keep reading, we're going to see how otherworldly or ridiculous this God kind of love is. Verse 6, you see at the right time when we are still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. So here it says that we were powerless. Powerless. You know what the difference is between rehab and the ICU? In rehab, you're actually well enough to uh, allow your effort to count. But in the ICU, you're too desperate for your effort to count. Especially if you're unconscious and unable to breathe on your own, which describes uh, most uh, patients or many patients in the ICU. And Paul's understanding of our human condition it's not that we were well enough to recover on our own in rehab. It's that we were in the ICU. In rehab, you can take credit for your recovery, but in the ICU, if you make it, uh, it's going to be because the medical professionals made it happen. Uh, you're in their hands. You're in their hands. So we were that powerless. Not only were we powerless, but we were ungodly. Now, Ungodly means we were not like God. Not long ago, we celebrated Veterans Day, and there's a holiday similar to Veterans Day called Memorial Day in the month of May, and it's a day we honor those who have given their lives for the freedoms that we enjoy. And, you know, when those brave soldiers gave their lives, they did it for their country and their countrymen, but, you know, they were giving their life for people who are like them, uh, people who look like them, probably, people who had the same passports that they had, uh, people who sang the same national anthems, who celebrated the same national holidays, who spoke uh, the same language and shared the same cultural norms. Uh, and generally speaking, we like people who are like us. And we would like you more if you were more like us. You know, my daughter, uh, she really wanted one of her school friends to meet one of her church friends because she thought they were so alike that they would hit it off. So at her birthday party, she kept trying to get them to talk to each other. And she said, they're going to like each other because they're so alike. I found that in the church world, too, people actually don't appreciate differences in approaches, in styles, and uh, in culture. And, and that's why most churches in the United States of America and probably all over the world are made up of the same kind of people. Each congregation, they all look alike, they think alike, they worship alike, uh, one, one or the other. They all earn alike. Yeah, I'm going there. But here we see that Christ dies for people who are nothing like him. Christ is godly, and he dies for the ungodly. Look with me in verse 7. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, you know those heroic soldiers who laid down their lives for their country and their countrymen? They were probably thinking about the innocent of their country, not the criminals. They weren't dying for the people on death row. They were thinking about that newborn baby, hoping that that innocent child will be able to know a life of freedom. They were thinking about that senior citizen in the nursing home, hoping that she could end her life in peace. They're not thinking about the murderer in state prison. They're not thinking about the scam artist in federal prison. But Christ dies for sinners. Sinners are criminals. It only takes one crime to be a criminal. It only takes one sin to be a sinner. 
And I know some of this is hard for us to swallow because all our lives we've been told that there's good people and then there's bad people. And of course, we're the good people and they're the bad people. The good people are us. The bad people are them. But when it comes to God's law, we're all criminals. That's something that everyone on planet Earth has in common. Even the model citizen on Earth is still a criminal in heaven because it only takes one crime to be a criminal, and that's who we were. We were criminals, and yet he loved us and gave his life for us. That's the God kind of love. Look with me in verse 9. For since we have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more being reconciled shall we be saved through his life? So now here we see that we're enemies. Going back to those soldiers, those brave soldiers that we commemorate on Memorial Day, I don't know if they intended to give their life for their enemies. I, I think they were thinking about their family and their friends back home. They're not dying for their enemies. And this is why the gospel message is so scandalous. is because Jesus dies for his enemies. It's understandable for someone to die from their enemies, but it's very difficult to comprehend why anyone would want to die for their enemies. I mean, isn't it a disturbing thought to think that Jesus was dying for the very Jews that conspired against him and put him through a mock trial? I mean, isn't it disturbing and, and, and uh, you know, it, it just is unnerving that he would die for the Roman soldiers that were brutally torturing him to a bloody death on the cross? Not only does he die for his enemies, he dies for his father's enemies. Now, did you know it's harder to forgive the people who have hurt our loved ones than those who have even offended us? And here Jesus dies for the enemies of his father. I heard about a story of a missionary couple from Australia named Graham and Gladys Stainis. And we have their picture up on the screen. And they felt called to India, and they took their three kids to work in a leper clinic. But on January 22nd, 1999, uh, Gladys, uh, the wife, the mom, she found out that her husband and her two boys were burned alive by an anti-Christian mob. Upon hearing the news, she grieved, understandably so. And then she said to the friends who were there to grieve with her, whoever did this, we will forgive them. Because that's the good news. There is forgiveness for every sin through the vessel of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm sure most people who are in her shoes would have fled India to never return. because They obviously don't appreciate her ministry, but she felt called to stay in India with her daughter, and she continued to minister to the same people in the very same place, and six years later, she built a whole hospital, and she was given an ex exceptional award by the Indian government uh, for the impact that she had upon that nation. That's the love of God. That's agape in action. And the reason why that kind of love is difficult for us to understand is because it's not normal in our fallen world. It's not natural to us in our fallen state. Remember in Romans 3 verse 23, it says we have fallen short of the glory of God. And one of the things we fell from was we fell from agape. And we fell so far, we fell so hard that there's no way we can get back to agape. That's why agape came down to us. As that song says, love came down and rescued me. Love came down and set me free. Now, there are four Greek words for love, and I wish we had four words for love too. I wish we didn't just use the same word for, you know, that I love chocolate and I love my kids, you know, that same word, or I love my mom and I love tacos. Uh, I wish we had different words for love, but here are the four Greek words for love. Number one is storge, and uh, it speaks of natural affection. 
Uh, C.S. Lewis talked about this as the mo- most common form of love on the earth. And it's the affections, the natural affections that a mother will have for her newborn baby. And hey, before you think that's the highest form of love and that's, you know, evidence of godliness in someone's life, bear in mind that bears and penguins and elephants also are capable of this kind of love. Did you know an elephant will mourn the death of their baby? C.S. Lewis goes on to say that this uh, storge, natural affection, is directed towards those who are uh, familiar to us. So our family, or our country, or even like our favorite coffee shop or restaurant. And um, let's go to the second word for love, and it's phileo, and it speaks of friendship. And it's usually a bond over common interest or a common cause. I love when our mission trips... um, on our mission trips, how the mission teams, uh, they develop this friendship. And, and I see people who serve together here in this church, and they develop a friendship from like passions and having uh, a common vision. Uh, maybe like on a sports team or among coworkers, there's this friendship that develops. And uh, you know, if we have nothing to talk about and no uh, mutual interest, there probably won't be a friendship. Uh, And and this is why C.S. Lewis goes on to say in his book, Four Loves, that uh, friendship must be about something, even if it's about getting excited over dominoes. Uh, uh, You know, and he was thinking those toys. Uh, But, but, you know, it has to be about something. Here's the most popular uh, expression of love, eros. And it speaks of romance. And this is when two people just want to be together 24-7 and they can't stay away from each other. And then they say, oh, we're just friends. Come on. They aren't looking at a common cause or interest. They're looking at each other. So in storge, we care for a person. In phileo, we enjoy a person. But then in eros, we are obsessed with that person. And this is why when you're in the eros stage, or category, now there are feelings of jealousy that's experienced. Because when someone you're looking at is now looking at someone else, that makes you angry and feel jealous. Or when someone else is encroaching upon that unique relationship you have with the person that you're looking at, you feel jealous. But C.S. Lewis writes that these feelings of passion, eros, will come and go. And it's not sustainable here on planet Earth. He says that it will not last forever in any kind of uh, earthly relationship. But C.S. Lewis wrote that it's actually a small foretaste of our eternal relationship with the Lord. Now, many songs have been written about Eros. And that's why I think it's the most popular form of love. But just because it's the most popular doesn't mean it's the highest form of love. You know, those three loves that we talked about, Storge, Phileo, and uh, Eros, they are commonly experienced and expressed here on earth. But there's a different kind of love that comes from heaven. And it's this fourth kind of love that separates humans from the animal kingdom. Because it's God's love that we can experience. Um, and it comes from the Holy Spirit. It's agape. Agape. This is an unconditional love. It's extended to the powerful and the powerless alike. It's extended to the godly and the godless, to the righteous and to the sinner, to uh, the friend and to the enemy. It's an indiscriminate love. And it's also this um, immutable love where phileo can be fickle and can fluctuate, but not agape. Agape doesn't flinch. Agape doesn't fade. Uh, Agape is a is a love that initiates. It doesn't require you to love for agape to be extended. It's a one-way love. You know, we by nature, we're selfish, but this love is by nature selfless. And so agape is not using somebody to benefit yourself. It's giving yourself for another person so that they can advance. Jesus talked about agape love in John 15, 33, where he says, greater love is no one than this for a man to lay down his life for his friends. So this uh, motive is completely altruistic. There's no ulterior motive. It's not let me do good so I can take a picture and post it on social media. You know, sometimes in uh, like the mentoring world, some people might want to mentor you so they can take credit for what you're doing. 
So they're actually trying to build their own legacy, and you're a brick. <laughs> or they feel good when they help you, but at the end of the day, it's all about how they feel. So it's selfish still. Or they want to gain financially from you, and, and, and that's uh, very common as well. But the motive of agape is to lay down your life for someone else so that they can succeed. It's wanting what's best for others. And so, you know, when I say that, some of us would be wondering, well, agape love means being a doormat then, huh? No thanks. But, you know, agape love, it doesn't have borders. But that doesn't mean we don't live with boundaries. Because there are plenty of scriptures that command us to have boundaries boundaries. When Jesus says, don't throw your pearls to the pigs, he's talking about boundaries. When Jesus says, I, I only do what I see the Father doing and leading me to do, he was talking about boundaries. He didn't do everything he could do. He was very precise with how he led his life. So we are not to have borders when it comes to our love, but we are supposed to have boundaries when it comes to our life. Amen? Amen. So we should truly wish uh, the best for everyone. We should pray for everyone. That's what Jesus taught us in Matthew 5, verse 43 to 44. Pray for your enemies and you know, pray for those who despitefully use you. He says, actually, love your enemies. Don't just tolerate them. Actually, love them. Uh, intercede for them. Uh, but, uh, you know, See, that's why Jesus, when he's hanging on the cross, he's praying for those who are crucifying him, praying for their forgiveness while they were torturing him. But did you notice that Jesus on the cross did not entrust his mother to the Roman soldiers? He entrusted his mother to his faithful friend, John. Pray for everyone. Don't partner with everyone. Love everyone. Don't trust everyone. Be generous with your love. Be very selective with your trust and with your investment. Oh, you don't love me. No, I love you. I just don't trust you. <laughs> Look at what you do with your life. I can't trust you. Look at your patterns. I can't trust you. You wanted to kill me last week. I can't trust you. C.S. Lewis talked about agape love as the highest level of love. And that all other loves are inferior, but he proposed that maybe the other loves prepare us for this highest form of love. So we come into this world and we receive natural affection from our parents. And hopefully we did. And that is supposed to prepare us for a friendship. So, you know, we, we, we can be a good friend and then hopefully it can prepare us for, for marriage and, you know, coming into a romantic relationship. And, uh, but ultimately, the goal of the Christian life is agape. Agape. You, you know what's funny? As I was um, uh, meditating on this, I realized that many people go into marriage thinking that it's going to be level three all day and all night. But marriage was not designed to take you to level three. It was designed to take you through level three into level four, agape love. That's why my friend Kathy Greer says everyone who gets married should wear black to their funeral because you're dying. <laughs> you're laying down your life for someone else. <laughs> Some of us think that it's going to be eros forever. No, that's not possible. It's only a foretaste of what will be forever. That's our relationship with the Lord. Amen. Yeah, we could put our hands together for that. Let's give God praise for that. You know, agape love is not from us. That's why it's so foreign. And therefore, we need the Holy Spirit to pour this love into our hearts. Therefore, Jesus had to come to reveal this love to us. And again, this is the goal of the Christian life, according to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Now, Paul is challenging the readers to not underestimate the love of God, because his love is not based on our performance. Uh, God's love is different than the love that we're accustomed to. Now, you know, I love my kids because they're my kids. I love my kids even because they look like me. 
God loved us when we were children of the devil. The scriptures talk about those who have had murderous intent and have rejected the truth as children of the devil. John, uh, the disciple, said we're children of the devil if we don't practice righteousness and love. And I could say that in my life, I acted more like Satan than I did God. Anybody else here, you resembled more that father than the heavenly one. But he still loved us and he still gave his, himself for us because this isn't storge. This is agape that we're talking about. You know, on earth, we can experience fallout with friends. We usually bond over a shared interest, and then we fight over some kind of disappointment or disagreement. But God's love is beyond phileo. He disagrees with you all the time. You disappoint him all the time, and yet his love refuses to dissipate. How many of you have been involved in a one-sided romantic relationship Or maybe you're still into it and the other person is no longer into it and that can be painful. But God's love is beyond eros. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Amen? Steadfast is better than sexy. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Amen. Verse 10. For if while we are God's enemies, we are reconciled to him through the death of his son. Now we're reconciled to God because of agape love. Usually when there's reconciliation in relationships, it's because both sides did their part and they met in the middle. But that's not true of our relationship with God. Our reconciliation with God happened because it was 100% God and 0% us. God the Father and God the Son made it happen on the cross. The second part of that verse, it says, How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? And we see that, you know, even though Jesus died, he's still alive. His death reconciled us to God, but his resurrection allows us to now live a supernatural life because he lives in us. Because he lives in us. You know, there was a Jewish professor from UC Berkeley who taught philosophy named Arthur Katz. And he was searching for God. And so he decided to take some time off of work and embark on a spiritual quest. And he traveled the world looking for God. And when he was in Germany, he uh, sat down next to a 19-year-old uh, lady who had just become a Christian a few days prior, and she's trying to share Jesus with him. She's only been with Jesus for a couple days, but here she is trying to share Jesus with this uh, re- really uh, intelligent college professor from UC Berkeley. And uh, this college professor's like, man, what makes your Jesus different from all of the other gods on planet Earth? He was basically implying he's just one of many paths. And she replied with this unforgettable glow on her face. And she said, Jesus is God. Jesus is love. And Jesus lives in my heart. And she said it with such joy beaming from her face. And he, he couldn't forget what she said. Her words haunted him. For the next six months. And six months later, he became a born-again Christian. In Israel, of all places, through the witness of a Messianic Jew, and he writes in his story, uh, in, in a book called Ben Israel, he says that's when Jesus, who is God, who is love, moved in and came into my heart too. And that's how we experience more of God's saving grace when he, as he moves in. Verse 11, not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. You know, this year, we have seen so many people, more than any other year, by far this year, and I think it's going to uh, you know, be exponential next year, but we've seen so many people get healed by the power of God through our church. Yeah, that's amazing. It was like every week I was hearing some kind of testimony. Out there, in here, it didn't matter. It was happening everywhere. And it needs to. God's turning up his power in this hour because we need it. Because we need it. 
But you know when that happens? It's him. It's his power. I mean, we can't hear, heal a fly. We can't heal an ant. So when healing happens, it, it's not happening, uh, you know, from us. It's, it's happening through us, but, but it's from God. You know, we're, we're just the wire. He's the electricity. And therefore, we give glory to God. We, we never take glory or take credit when somebody gets healed. Amen. Right? You know, this year, we've seen so many people get touched by the Holy Spirit and get filled with the Holy Spirit. And uh, when that happens, it's, it's his power that's just simply flowing through us. Somebody wrote me an email. No, no, sorry. They, they, they printed out a letter, and, and they put it in, in a box, and, and I, I received the letter. And he said, uh, you know, Pastor Daniel, I'm the guy who's always falling asleep while you're speaking. And, uh, you know, he said, when, a long time ago when I was a little boy, you know, I... Uh, um, <laughs> It was a long time ago when I was a little boy, I went to a Pentecostal church and got baptized with the Holy Spirit. But, you know, it's been a really long time since I ever experienced anything of the Holy Spirit. It's been 50, 60 years. And he said, but last Sunday, I just came up to the front. And as people were praying for me, I got baptized with the Holy Spirit all over again. I couldn't stop speaking in tongues. But when stuff like that happens, it's happening through us. The power is simply just flowing through us. I, you know, for a while before I, I was doing this church, I was uh, doing youth meetings, and I was a youth speaker. And many times, this was kind of a trademark of, of my ministry, was many times the power of God would hit the youth like a bomb. It, it would look like a bomb went off in that place. It would happen over and over and over again. And, you know, it was never the power of Daniel. It was the power of the Holy Spirit. I remember there was times that I would just walk up to somebody and it would be like wind. I would feel wind coming from behind me and knock the other person down and I didn't even touch them. And, and so who am I to say, oh, that was me? I can knock people down too, you know, but, but no, no, no. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, we always give God glory. You know, this year we've seen accurate words of knowledge released. And, uh, you know, it's... It's when you have knowledge that you wouldn't have been able to know, but it's like the Holy Spirit just whispered in your ear, and it's like you were given a cheat sheet. And, and if it's right on, it's not because you knew. <laughs> it's because God revealed it to us. Did you know I don't even know what I ate for dinner two days ago? And yet when I can know something by the Holy Spirit, it has to be the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we give God glory. And yet Paul makes it clear that, you know, in 1 Corinthians 13, that we can be used by God to work miracles, and we can have such faith and such knowledge. But if that agape love is not flowing in and through us, all of that's worthless. All of that's worthless. Now, through um, the finished work of the cross, you know, we've been reconciled to God. And now, because Jesus lives in and through us, that agape love can be flowing in and through us. But, you know, as that love flows in and through us, we're going to boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to boast in God. We're going to give him the glory. Because we remember what life was like when we were disconnected from him, right? Remember what life was like? I mean, maybe there was storge, probably, Maybe there was some phileo, probably. I mean, probably a lot of drama, too. But, I, you know, yeah, there was definitely eros, you know. Um, but that agape wasn't flowing. But when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord, that's when we're able to love supernaturally. Amen? Amen. And therefore, we give God glory through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received this reconciliation. Can we stand and let's pray? You know, as I'm here, um, Lord, what would you have for us for ministry time? 
I believe that there's going to be some deep inner healing. I believe there's going to be some deliverance here today. Demons are not afraid of storge, phileo, or eros. But when agape shows up, the powers of darkness must flee. The powers of darkness must flee. And that is what we read about, that the love of God, agape, will be, will, will be poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And, and let's pray for that. Now, So, Lord, we just welcome you. We pray for an encounter with your love today. For every heart. For every heart. Lord, we thank you for the power that's in your love. To transform. To, to resurrect. To, to restore, to, to liberate, to resuscitate. Father, we thank you for the power that's in your love. And I ask you, Lord, that you would confirm your word. We don't just study your word just to study it. God, we, we believe that you're the God who confirms your word. That when we preach it, when we teach it, you do it. So God, I just call on your power that you would release today. Pour the power of your love into this room, into the hearts of my brother, my sister, my friend, the person who's visiting for the very first time. Holy Spirit, would you come and fill our hearts with your love.